you can make a lot of money and still be poor. The rules have changed. Those old rules of the millionaire next door and buy and hold and pray, they are antiquated and right. they're going to harm people. So there's a lot of people who are millionaires, but they're broke. If you can understand that, isn't that true? Yeah. Net worth is relatively worthless if you can't, can't convert to cash flow. That's right. That's the bottom line. Hello, it's Robert Kiyosaki. And for those who may not know me, I'm best known for the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And today I'm talking to Garrett Gunderson, right here. And he is the author of this book here, Killing Sacred Cows. And it came out the first time in 2008. And uh, this is a re reprint here. Yep, it is. Well, yeah. congratulations. Thank you. Thank book, you. Books had major impact around the world, so you know, thank well, you. Well, I mean, Rich Dad Poor Dad was the the catalyst, really. So open the open the doorway, and I really appreciate that. Well, thank you, thank you. It's nice to see young people coming up, and um, because you know, people will say I like what you said, and a lot of people don't like what I say. So, hey, thank you. Uh, the subject today is a thing called financial education, which is a very big subject. And uh, the real key here is this, there's financial education for the poor, there's financial education for people who are middle class, and there's financial education for those who want to be rich. So today we're all, you know, Garrett and I are going to be saying something that some of you may, dis may disturb you because some of you are actually still poor people. You, you know, they, you can make a lot of money and still be poor. Right, it's, it's that person's choice and their yeah. freedom. Yeah. Believe in freedom is a core value. Yeah. yeah, you want to be poor, have a good time. You know, I've, I've been poor, I've been happy, and I've been middle class, and I've been happy, and I've been rich, but I've been happier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So today you're going to find out once again, if you're poor, you know, what, what is financial education for you? If you're middle class, what's the best financial education for you? And then what is rich? And so the thing I really enjoyed about Garrett's story is this, is that as a young guy, uh, where were you growing up? Uh, Price, Utah, a small coal mining town with maybe 12,000 people in it. And uh, how old were you when you got the book, The Millionaire Next Door? I think, I think I was probably 16 years old when I got that book and it was the first financial book I had read. And uh, so that's what I thought there was. That's how I thought you did it at first. Right. And just for your information, the Millionaire Next Door was written by, I think, a PhD or something. And yep. Stanley is his name. Exactly. And uh, it came out in 96. And I read the book, and a lot of people loved it. Do you know what I mean? And that's our conversation today. For a lot of people, Millionaire Next Door is a great book. But when I read it, I went, Shh, I'd never do this stuff. Well, unfortunately, yeah. I followed it at first and kind of cut back. And yeah. I, it, no one shrinks their way rich, but that book's about how to shrink, right? right. Uh, how to cut out. Yeah. So for the middle class, if you like being middle class and you don't really like risk and all that stuff and you love paying taxes, <laughs> it's a great book. So I'm not, again, I want you to hear that we're not trying to make fun of anything or any of the viewers or listeners. It's really important you know who you are. Like, the, like I said, I've been poor, and I was quite happy being poor. And I've been middle class, and I've been rich. But for me to change, I had to change whose advice I listened to. Isn't that true? Yep. So um, so you read Millionaire Next Door. What, what, how did you respond to it? I mean... Well, I, I became uh, basically a cheapskate. I, I was on my path to being a broke millionaire. I, I, I counted every dollar. I was so attuned with budgeting, but I wasn't thinking about value creation and production. I kind of adopted a scarcity mindset, right. which was all about, you know, what could I save? What could I uh, cut back on? What could I eliminate? I went on a trip with my wife to San Diego, and the whole time I was there, I thought about how much how everything how much everything cost and that I wasn't in my business which at the time was more like self-employed with the cash flow quadrant than it was a business so I wasn't making money when I was away so I'm thinking about all those dollars consuming my mind consuming my time and my wife is like we're spending less money on food and we're on our vacation this doesn't feel like a vacation it feels like a prison so that's how I I, I mean I took it yeah. pretty seriously when I read that book and when I read the book you know I think you talked about I don't know, it's been, old, it's been 96, and my book came out in 97, I go, oh, geez. So in 96, I read about it, you know, and, you know, today I don't drive one Ferrari, I drive two Ferraris. Now, would Mr. Stanley recommend driving Ferraris? Absolutely not, no. right. And let me tell you something, I feel better in a Ferrari, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's a wonderful car, but so is a Toyota. So for most people, they should drive a Toyota Prius, right? 
According to that book, absolutely. Yeah. Now, if it makes you happy. <laughs> but only if you paid cash for that car. Yes, yes. <laughs> I hate to say yes. <laughs> but anyway, I have a friend who absolutely loves her Toyota Prius. You know? And I may be Japanese, but I don't look good in Toyotas. You know? I look better in Ferraris. So uh, this is what we're getting at here. You see, it's your values, yep. right? Values. So when you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, now you're struggling with Stanley's book about the millionaire next door. And what there, how you became a millionaire was interested. It was very easy in 1996 to become a millionaire just because the economy went like this in America. Right. So you bought a house, let's say, when you're 25, for let's say eighty thousand dollars, and by you know some years later, the house is now worth a million dollars. Right. And that's how you became rich. You were you were getting rich by being frugal and riding the U.S. economy up, investing in the stock market. It went up, but the problem is today it's not going this way. It's going this way. Absolutely. Right. So Absolutely. that's why the millionaire next door is still a good book, but you may be going this you way. Might ride that wave all the way yeah. down and crash. So that's the point. I want to be very clear. I'm not making fun of Dr. Stanley or anybody else who mentioned today. The point is, what's inside of you? You know, are you happy with a Toyota Prius? Knock yourself out. I'm not. Okay, if you understand that point of it. Like, I've always had nice cars because I like nice cars. Yeah. I love nice cars. I know we've had some of the same cars yeah. in our past. Yeah. And my first car was a 1969 Corvette, and I graduated from college in 1969 you know so I was really happy and I did other things to pay for the car now some other people's Toyota Prius is that correct yes and for some people the bus is fine right yeah I know, I know people who are very happy because they take a bus right or ride a bike or ride a bike yes. yeah and it just depends on you so that's our story today so please don't get upset if you think I'm making fun of people so then you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, right? I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and that clicked. That resonated. That and your made spirit. sense. Yeah, and before I thought it was all about what I could cut back and set aside for 30 right. years, and all of a sudden I was like, wait, cash flow. That could be something Asset immediate. Creation. That's, you know, create assets to produce cash flow. Yeah. And, and that changed the trajectory of my career, of my focus, of right. my life. And that's the reason I like this book here, is Killing Sacred Cows. It's what's really killing a lot of people financially is they have a sacred cow. Right. Like, you know, the old sacred cows that worked for my generation are you go to school, but you learn nothing about money. Right. You get a job, and today kids are going to school and they're finding no jobs, but they're deeply in debt. Okay. You save money. <laughs> And why would you save money when the Fed is printing trillions of dollars? Exactly. And you buy a house because your house is an asset. And in 2007, the housing prices plunged. They got wiped out. And I think the worst thing of all, between what we agree on, is invest for the long term in a 401k full of mutual funds, right? Right. And so First those thing are, I attacked in my book was that. Yeah. And so those are sacred cows. Why would you save money when the Fed has admitted to printing four trillion dollars? Because they can print it faster than you can save it, right? Right. And then this thing about get out of debt. I mean, debt is money, you know? But it's good advice for the poor and middle class and all this stuff. So these are some of the sacred cows. So what happened to you when you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad? Well, the first thing I did is I went and bought the cash flow game. Right. Because it talked about that. And then I invited my friends over. And we, it was actually a Friday night. We got all of them together. And we started and playing the guy. game. How old were you? Yeah, at that time I was 18, probably. I mean, we're in college. We're, we had people over at our house all the time, so I invited everybody over. We, we played the game together, and it, it really started to separate out Your friends. like friends and philosophy, right? Which was hard at the time, but helpful long run, right? right? So some of the people that I played that game with way back then, I work with now. I partnered on deals with right. others. It gave me the insight that you would never want to do business with them. Right. And again, I want to reiterate this. There's poor, middle class, and rich. And ri the cash flow game teaches people to be rich. And there's other people who don't want to be rich. They just want to be middle class, which is their choice. It matches their spirit. So here we are in 2015. This is what we're saying, guys. There's poor, middle class, and rich, and there's advice for poor people. A lot of people like being poor. Yep. And you want to be middle class, that's great advice for you. And you want to be rich, that's great advice for them. So what if I came to you, he's 2015, and I said, Mr. Gunderson, I'm a financial planner. 
You know, I sell life insurance primarily. But, you know, the stock market goes on up on average 7%. So that's why you should invest for the long term. What would you say to me? This is 2015. <laughs> I'll say, whatever happened in the past has no chance of happening in the near term. And I'm worried about that thing going down a lot in the near term. And what if I said to you, I said, look, but, you know, there's dollar cost averaging and, you know, it's over the long term. And, you know, you'll be, you'll be a millionaire in 40 years. What will you say to that? Well, I actually did a little research, and from 2000 until this year, adjusted for inflation, the stock market did 8.4% 8, 8 total, not per year. Oh. Total. How many years? Adjusted that? for inflation. That's almost 15 years. But you don't know what you're talking about. So I'm a financial planner. <laughs> now, let me ask you this. How much training did you have as a financial planner? I had I had a few years training. It was uh, not that much though. So all my training. No, how, uh, how long does it take to get a license? Uh, about a week at most. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, I took a test while I was in college, and they got. They Did gave you know me, anything about markets? No. But you you were selling. You were selling. I got my Series Six and Sixty Three license. It took you a week. It took me a week. I took a. I bought a so, book. I scheduled the test, and I got like a ninety three percent on that test. So what you see, financial planners do, coming out. The moment you get licensed, do you know much? No, not at all. Are you qualified to advise somebody how to put their future, on, you know, provide for the future? Absolutely not. I mean, you know, it's all about cliches like you're in it for the long haul or in almost all your trainings on how to build trust, how to build selling, a relationship. Right? It's all selling. I mean, yeah. you, you barely learn about the product. You have no idea, right? Right. You just have these charts. And they always love to show the charts when the market's up. They don't quite publish them during the downturns right. as often, right? Right. And this is the, the other part about it. How long does it take to become a licensed massage therapist? I don't know, but probably a lot longer than it takes to it's be about a... about six months. I mean, dentists, it takes how many years? years? I mean, you know, surgeons, we're talking eight extra years of school afterwards. Yet, I mean, I could, you, you can give me whatever financial test needs to happen. I'll, I'll tell you this. When I wrote Killing Sacred Cows, my legal team said, you know what, you're pretty bold with a few of these things. You're calling out 401ks, you're calling yeah. out financial institutions. Well, so do I. Yeah. We're worried, yeah. yeah. They're like, we're worried about lawsuits, and so one of the things we think you should do is go get your registered investment advisory and set up a firm and pass the test. So it's a Series 65. And I had forgotten that I signed up for the test. And on Sunday, I realized when I looked at my calendar for Monday, I had that test Monday morning. So I'm like, well, I better study a little bit. But there was a great basketball game on, and I got really caught up in the basketball game because LeBron James was just going crazy. And I took the test the next morning and got an 88% with less than one hour study. And that was one of the higher degrees the Series 65 was. So let's say you know, it's really easy to pass the test, but do you know anything about actually planning for somebody's future? I learned more taking this Steve Harrop, my professor, to lunch in one hour that I had learned in one year of financial training. So you're selling stuff you don't even know what you're selling. I've never met the fund manager, as a matter of fact. I don't even know what stocks are being held other than the top 10 stocks. I've never been inside the boardroom of a single one of those companies. So I learned how much I didn't know because I went to get an analyst position at a fund. And when they started interviewing me and asking me about intrinsic value and alpha and beta and all this, I was like, I don't know, because I was a salesperson at that point. It right. was like this awakening and this reality right in my face. So would you say financial planners, are they experts? Uh, at, at selling. They're sell salesmen. No, but at planning your future. Absolutely not. There's okay. no financial planning. It's a selling of a product for retirement. Right. So there I just want to say this, okay? A financial plan is great. You learn a lot of things in it, how to budget, and you learn about wills and trust and insurance. There's things that are very value in it. But they're selling you something. That's the whole point here. So if you want to be poor, it's a great plan. And the thing that I always cringe at, because it happened to me when I went to work for the Xerox Corporation, I go into my HR, human resource person, they sit me down and they say, now choose which mutual fund you want in your plan. I, I don't know one mutual fund from the other. Did you know the difference? <laughs> no, they're just good marketing on which one was named better, right? Right. So they show you the four-star, Morningstar, and all yep. that stuff? Okay, so again, let me remind you what we're talking about. This is Garrett Gunderson. He's author of Killing Sacred Cows. And today the real subject is, do you want to be poor, middle class, and rich, and who do you listen to? So my point is, we're repeating, because re repetition is how we learn, is there was this great book, 
the millionaire next door. And it worked because the stock market was going up. This is Stanley. Like I said, my father bought a house, I think in 1967, it was $50,000, million two, million four a few years later. The trouble is he couldn't sell it because he had no place to go. So he was a yeah. net worth. No cash flow coming in. No cash flow, and he lost his job, and he was all this. But his stuff. taxes were going up. Yeah, his, ta his property that. taxes yeah. went up. So there's a lot of people who are millionaires, but they're broke. If you can understand that, isn't that true? Yeah. Net worth is relatively worthless if you can't can't convert to cash flow. That's right. That's the bottom line. So there's millions of baby boomers right now, my age, who are in trouble, right? Yep. They're in serious trouble, and the reason they're serious, I won't go into too much detail. But between 2008 and 2015 today, what the federal government did, the U.S. Treasury, is they borrowed out the money from the pension plans of government employees. So the pension plans are empty, as is Social Security. Social Security is empty. Yeah. yeah, Social Security is empty. So all of you right now who are my age, let's say you're 50 plus, you're going, well, I'm going to have a happy retirement. The real truth is, the odds are, it's not that you'll die poor, the odds are you'll run out of money before you die. I'm going to say this, what's going to happen, let's say you're like, say, real old, 67 or 68, and you're out of money and out of a job? I mean, is that possible? Oh, it's absolutely possible. One of the worst articles I ever read was the vice president of retirement services for Mass Mutual, a multi-billion dollar company, decided to retire in 1999. He took all of his money, but 100000 and put it in aggressive mutual funds. The 100000 was to buy a small fishing business. <laughs> the fishing business failed, and the market confiscated most of his wealth in 2000, 2001, and 2002. And his job was advising other people on retirement. The article showed him staying in front of a limo. He had become a limo driver for his retirement because everything got wiped out. And these are the people that are supposed to be giving advice to people on living right. a better retirement. So once again, Garrett's book here, It's Killing Sacred Cows. So what are some of the sacred cows rattling around in the heads of people today as they watch this video? So one of the first ones is they believe in the finite pie. So it's kind of that scarcity thinking is one of the sacred cows where people are in this consumer condition where they look to take more from the world than they give. They don't think about how they could produce to create more value. They don't think about how they could increase their impact and get more money. They think that you know, it's gonna be taken care of by someone else. And it's kind of this fear, doubt and worry kind of mindset. They think it's all on what they have to lose, not on what they can contribute. And that's the very first myth that I address in the book. Okay. So this is the point here. Most of you, if you're baby boomers, you're gonna run out of money before you die. That's the worst. What happens when people run out of money when they're, before they're dead? <laughs> well, uh, they, I guess they go and uh, become a burden on their family and start getting money from them. But did, did I think, you see that as a financial planner? Oh, you, you definitely see that, um, especially because what I'm helping plan with individuals their number one risk was, I'd ask them what their family was like, like their parents, and there's this reverse parenting that starts to happen where they're now paying for their parents' right. lifestyle because their retirements and their pensions and everything that was promised didn't turn out what it was supposed to be. So everybody's watching Janet Yellen today and they're watching Christine Lagarde of the IMF and the World Bank and all this stuff, and everybody's telling you, hold on. Meanwhile, what's happening just as we're, just as we're talking, Caterpillar, which is a very, very blue chip company, you know, you think, well, I have a job with Caterpillar. I'm safe. So Caterpillar in 2015 announced they're gonna lay off 5,000 people, and in 2016, another 10,000 to 15,000. So what does that say for job security if a company like Caterpillar, which is kind of a blue chip, not, it's not really a blue right. chip, but it's a solid company. These employees, what do they do now? Here we are at 2015, they're gonna invest for the long term? Right, and then just think about this, there's, people right now in garages coming up with the ideas that within the next 10 years are going to replace companies in the Fortune 500. We've never seen that kind of speed no. before. So if you're and they're not buying American, and holding, they're all over the world. Right, if you're buying and holding and hoping that's going to go up, the rules have changed. Those old rules of the millionaire next door and buy and hold and pray, they are antiquated and right. they're going to harm people because those companies, see one of the other things that's kind of a myth or a lie that's out there. Oh, wait, wait, it's, it's a sacred a cow. A sacred cow. Gotta plug your book A here, sacred man. cow, of course. <laughs> so this, one of the sacred cows is when we talk about averages in the market, one of the things that the little tricks they do is let's say I have an S&P 500 index fund. And let's say Woolworth goes out of business. Remember when they went out of business? 
they don't run that as a zero for the rest of the time, but if my money was in there at that time, that's always a zero for me. They just plug in a new company and say, here's the new S&P 500, and it exaggerates the returns from what the actual individual investor gets. So that's just one example. Yeah, There's a hundred of those examples. Yeah. And I cover this in this book here, A Second Chance. In here, there's not there's, there's a big book, but there's a lot of pictures in it. You know, So if you guys want to see pictures and all this, there's a lot of pictures you can look at it, and you can interpret the what's happening you know, for yourself here. Yeah. Then you can make up your own mind. So but you can so, know the truth so that you have yeah. the right insight. And it's not my charts, it's government charts. Right. So you, I mean, it's it's out there. It's just that yeah. you've found the data and, and give it in a way that people are actually interested to hear about it. And then I think where we just make a, a good uh, you know team doing this together is you've got people focused on cash flow. And if someone's willing to be a business owner, I help them keep so much more of that cash flow because they'll pay less in tax. They'll pay less in interest. They'll have more access to money. They won't be losing money to the institutions and all these kind of fees. And it's, it improves their life today, not 30 years from now. They can become economically independent, as you would say, get out of the rat race in a few years if they're committed to it. We've seen it happen. Yeah, but this is a, we're going to talk about that. See, most people can't do it. Right, because they're in the, they're no, taking advice on the poor side. They're, they're in the house. sacred cow. They have to kill the They're, they're hearing from the middle class, giving them the middle class advice. They have to kill their mother and father. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I think this is the chart here, and then uh, Darren will put them up there. But this is quantitative easing. They're printing money, and people are saying save money. Duh. You right. know? And I mean, then this here is the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar. When you print money, the purchasing power goes down, and people still say save money and work hard. Duh. How stupid are you? What well, if you want to be poor, don't pay attention to this. Well, because the poor and middle class get this advice all the time. If you want more money, save more and work harder. Right, and you already talk, yeah. work harder and save more. Take more risk, but it's risk on things that they know nothing about. No, See, they, they, they say live below your means. Yeah, live below your means. I hate cut living back. below my means. Right. I mean, I think living within your means. When most people hear that, they hear cutting back. I hear two other things: expand your means. Right. Well, I do. Expand your means, or be more efficient with every dollar you have that you're not giving the government more than they deserve. And pay less tax. Yeah, pay less tax. Exactly. So, so you can live within your means and and still drive two Ferraris, have a Bentley, live the life you want. It's just simply you invest in yourself. You grow your knowledge. You're a good real estate investor because you've invested the time. You've built the team. Those who are following the old rules or the old sacred cows. You're going to get hammered. So this is how we make changes, okay? And this is the whole message of today's program with Garrett. There's advice for poor people, there's middle class people, and rich people. If you like being poor, then Susie Orman is your best teacher. You know, what she says is cut up your credit yep. cards and live below your means. You know, for most people, that's good advice, right? Yeah. It's fantastic advice. You won't if get If you're rich. spending more than you make, you yeah. gotta listen to that. And it's not well at the point that you know Garrett's making here is not how much you make makes you poor. What makes you poor is you spend more than you make. Right. So you know I have a friend who says, you know, he makes a lot of money as an attorney. He says, My my wife has a black belt in spending. You know, she shops all day long. So he might let's say he makes a dollar, she'll spend ten. So when Susie Orman says cut up your credit cards, Fantastic advice. Right. Because if you don't stop that, you'll never be rich anyway, right? Totally agree with that. That's the problem. So Susie, you know, I love it when she had her show. And there's one woman called up. She says, oh, Susie, you know, I'm making $1,000 a month. 900 is going to rent, and I want to buy a puppy. And she goes, <laughs> well, how much is that puppy going to cost? Oh, $3,000. You know, how much Denied. Cost, yeah. <laughs> how much is it going to cost to feed it? Oh, 100 bucks a month? She goes, how are you going to pay for it? You how are you going to I mean? feed yourself? <laughs> yeah, how are you going to feed yourself? She goes, denied. I love it. Susie, keep doing that. You know what I mean? Because that person, if they don't change that, if they don't stop spending more Nothing than they make. Nothing else will save them. Yeah, because they'll, no. you know, so they, they get the higher paying job, they just spend more money. Yeah, it's Parkinson's law. The more they make, the more they spend. Yeah. And so that's why Susie Orman's fantastic advice for poor people. And then for the middle class, we have a whole bunch of people, okay? We have number one million in next door with yeah. Stanley. Yeah. And also we have Dave Ramsey. He is a friend of mine. He has fantastic advice. You want to be middle class, live debt free. And people go, oh, that's such a good idea. You know, debt free. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So you buy a house. <coughs> 
you pay it off, you buy a house, you know, all this stuff. I did that. When I had, when I was becoming rich, Kim and I lived in a little house, was at the Hilton Hotel in Phoenix here. But my monthly payments total was $310 a month and rent in the same house would have been $800 to $1,000. So it was really made a lot of sense to kind of live in a less expensive house. And with that extra money, we're buying apartment houses. And today, Kim and I have 10,000 apartment houses. Right. So Limit Dave the managed- cash flow going out, and you improved your cash flow yes. coming in. We expanded our means. Right. Expand your means, which you're not going to hear that from Dave. No. You're not going to hear that from Susie, because that's middle class and yeah. poor. So if you're middle class, you know, buy a little house, you know, pay it off, live debt free. So all of you who are middle class, it's live below your means. Live debt and free. live debt free. So it's just is cut up your credit cards. Get out of debt. See, that's very different, but that's great advice. What do you want to say about Dave's uh, Ramsey's advice on living debt free? It's good advice. He's right? got five basic principles that he teaches that I think are fantastic yeah. and keeps a lot of people on track and away from becoming a complete debt disaster. Right. He even has Susie has them cut it up. Dave has them freeze it in a block of ice, their credit card. Right. So if they ever need to get to it, they have to chop the ice up to get to the credit card. I mean, well, it's the same. Pro- <laughs> it's the same problem Susie's addressing. They can't control their spending. Exactly. And. The point here is this, if you can't do what Susie does and you can't do what Dave does, you shouldn't do what we do. Right. And that's the point here. If you can't do what Susie does and you can't do what Dave recommends, don't do what we do. You see, the point here is this, when you look at our stuff and look at the walls over here, my partners are like Donald Trump. You know, I don't think Donald Trump cuts up his credit cards. No. Okay, so we're gonna go today, this is the whole point. There's poor, middle class, and rich. The other people that are very, very good for middle class, you know, one is at Rick Edelman and David Bach. David right? Bach, yeah. Why, why is that for middle class? And that's that's still kind of latte factor. You know, don't spend more than you make. Don't buy a latte. You know, don't buy a latte. Cut out these things that you're not ready to, or mature enough to spend on. But what do they put the money in? Unfortunately, mutual funds. Yeah. Yeah. You see what I mean? That's good advice. How much money does Rick Edelman have under management? I believe it's around eleven billion dollars. So he's a rich man. Very. He very. doesn't do what he does. He doesn't do what we recommend. No, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the point. It's great advice if you want to be middle class. I'm not saying David Bach or Rick Edelman are bad people. I'm just saying it's middle class advice, and they put you in mutual funds, and you go, "Oh, this is so great." Because I went to their seminars. I'd sit there and I'd listen to them, and just like. What you did when you read Middle Millionaire Next Door, when I sat there, and I, Dave Edelman's a great guy, I shook hands with him and all this, and what I said in my back of my mind is, I would never do that, because right. I don't have to do that. Because you're playing by the rules of the, the rich, rich, not right. the rules of the middle class or the poor. And and see, what I, I'm when I was following that Millionaire Next Door, I was in financial services, right, and I'm peddling the products that we talked about, and I'm getting this award, this Rookie of the Year award at MDRT, and I'm feeling great about it. Yeah. And then this person who's much, you know, 10 years ahead of me and makes a lot more money, comes up and says, that's great, I can't wait till you learn the rules of the rich, though. And I was like, wait, I just got yeah. this award. And she says, the rich live Don't by different rules yes. than the middle class, and she's the one that had me Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Thank you. And I what got a- Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I read it, and I was like, Oh my God, I get it. This yeah. is totally different. It's very different. This is, this is completely different set of rules. Right. Completely different set of rules. Another great friend of mine, these guys all, not the, you know, like, I'm more friends with Dave Ramsey. Dave Ramsey's a great guy, but I don't think he follows his own rules. You know what I mean? He's got a pretty nice house. Yeah. No, but he also, <laughs> he was a real estate guy. Yeah. You know, he, he used it. You know, he knows he knows the game of the rich. Yeah. But he, he caters to people who want to be middle class because it feels better to them. Look, let me tell you. It really feels good to be debt free, right? Mm-hmm. But that's not how I live. Okay, so that's going to be the difference. Poor, middle class, and rich. Again, the reason I love your book here, Killing Sacred Cows, what's killing them is up here. Mm-hmm. You see, they think they're doing the right thing. You know, I have a 401k and I'm investing for the long term, you know, and it's, you know, it's tax deferred, you know, it's a tax free account. Setting up college funding for college my kids funding, with yeah. 529s. And you're getting ripped off. Yeah, 529, I always say 529 is not mine. That's what they should be saying, because it's actually, once again, the government owns those plans. Yeah, and the whole point here is you have to decide, and this is our whole message today, just like when you read Millionaire Next Door, it hurt you. Yep. 
but for many people it feels good. Yeah, it was it was a philosophy that with hard work gave me utter frustration. Right. For others, they love to save. They get you know yeah. they like never to spend. They 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 yeah. love to see money sitting in a bank account, not really doing much, but it's sitting in the bank account. And that wasn't how I I didn't love that. Well, I I have a friend, you know. It's a woman, she's about 45 years old, she has six million in savings and she rides a bicycle. And in her mind, this is in Hawaii, she is King Tut, you know what I mean? She is so happy. And you had six million in savings, I'd be pretty happy too. Right? Yeah. You know what I mean? But riding a bicycle would destroy me. You know? <laughs> I mean, she's healthier than I am, which is a good thing too. Right. But the whole point here is this, your financial advice depends on who you are. So if you're poor, Susie Orman, your middle class, it's Dave Ramsey, live debt free, cut up your credit cards. Now we get to the rich and the rich are opposite. And that's what I cover in this book here, Second Chance. Everything the poor and middle class do, the rich do differently. For example, I don't want to get out of debt. I love debt. Now, that's what I hear a person say to me is, I don't have any money, so I can't invest. Well, that's a poor middle class thought. Right. You see, I don't need my money. The banks will give me all the money I want. And so last year, well, this year, 2015, we refinanced $300 million of debt. 300 million is not Donald Trump money, it's one third of a billion dollars. But we refinanced it down from 5% to 2.5%. Some nice cash flow. You know how much money way. we made refinancing three hundred million in debt. And how cheap is that money? See, yeah, and that's what's so funny, right? The money yeah. is cheapest before, but Susie's didn't get out of debt. Well, here's here's a really or good. Ramsey is yeah, saying. here's a here's a good couple of questions to see where someone's mindset is. I like to ask him if I'm willing to lend you money at zero percent, how much would you take? See, and if someone doesn't tell me they take as much as they can get, I know they're in the middle class or the poverty. Yeah. Or if I say if I'm not charging interest, how fast do you want to pay me back? Right. They should be saying, I want to pay you back as slowly as possible. Debt makes us rich. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. To understand the difference between poor middle class and rich, Dave Ramsey is saying live debt free. And what makes the rich rich is they know how to use debt. That's the difference. That's why in 1973, I came back from Vietnam. My rich dad said, take a real estate course. It had nothing to do with real estate. It had to do with real estate is debt and taxes. And I had to learn how to buy a piece of property using 100% debt. Once I learned to buy a property with 100% debt and still make $25, I knew I could make money off of debt. Yep. Whereas Dave Ramsey is saying live debt free and Susan is saying cut up your credit card. And what happened to your taxes? Well, wait, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, so debt makes the rich rich, right? Yep. Okay, now the more debt you have and the more real estate you buy, what happens to taxes? It's going to continue to go down. You pay zero tax. Yep. Do you understand that what makes the, again, everything is covered in this book, it's opposite. The more real estate I buy using debt, the less tax I pay, the more money I make. The other thing, so I use now, I use debt to get rich mm -hmm. and I pay no tax. This is where you and I really line up. When you were playing the cash flow game, what came out of the game? Wasn't it your team or something? Oh yeah, I, I realized that I had to build a team and it yes. couldn't just be, financial planners or people that gave advice. I wanted people that actually lived it, done it, were wealthy, that spent time with wealthy people. And it took me about a decade to build that team, maybe yes. a little bit longer. It was, I'm still building it was a heavy, team. And, you know, but I got to tell you, it's paid off massively. Yes. I mean, that's, that's one of my advantages that most people have is the yes. type of team that I have and that I built. And that's part of what we do is we build teams for people that way. Right. And this is the part that kills most people. Okay. In school, if you operate with a team, it's called cheating. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So tell them, tell them what your team consists of today, because it's the same thing I say. It's my, my team is called my Rich Dad Advisors. Right? Yeah. What do you call your I team? I call mine the Accredited Network, and in joking, I call them the Financial Nerd Network, because yes, these smart. are people that love this stuff. Yeah. I mean, even, even part of my team is having a guy that's good at understanding liability insurance. He can read any, he can tell you off the top of his head, any contract, how it works, how to transfer risk. It's I amazing. You, I want you to do that on my team too. It's not another rich dad advisor, but I have an insurance guy who reads all the insurance contracts. Yep. And so he'll say, Hey, did you know if we structure this with an, uh, anyway, not going to content, but with That's an umbrella, then you're going to save this money and you're going to have $10 million more coverage. I'm going, 
genius, but that's what he looks for. Then other people I have on my team is like an estate planning and corporate structuring attorney. Right. So my asset protection trust, but he's also someone who's independently wealthy, has done a huge amount of real estate. He practices what he's he He's very well connected. He has billionaire clients. So I was like, look, I might be, when I start with him, I was one of his smaller clients, but I referred so many good people to him that he brought me into the inner circle right. and has been great to me. Who else is on your team? So on my team, I've also, I do have a registered investment advisor that helps me research and analyze deals. And he's also also, kind of my no guy. What would? Why wouldn't I do this investment? You sniff out what's wrong with it and how we protect it. Then I also have a cash flow specialist. That his job is just to look and analyze cash flow and make sure I look great to the banks. So when I go to a bank, I look good because my cash flow is good, yeah. collateral's right, credits there. So once again, it's, it's, these are big steps, but it's a change of the spirit. You know, the being in here, because you know when I talk about, you know, you should have a team. What stops most people from having a team is, is in school, you were taught that you had to be the smartest guy. Yeah. Are you the smartest guy on your team? No. I'm not the smartest guy on my team. If I were, I'd be in trouble, right? Because, yeah. because you always want you always want to room well, the, with people that help you grow. The most stupid people are people who think they're smart. And I've been that <laughs> person. You know, yeah. I know all the answers. I meet these guys who are PhDs, you know, MBAs, accountants, lawyers. They think they're the smartest guy and they don't ask for help, you know? And I was always a dumb shit in school, so I always ask the smart kids about stuff. So when it comes to investing, I look for the smartest guys that practice what they preach. So they're called rich dad advisors. It's bigger than their advisors. But I have Kenny McElroy who writes about real estate, yeah. but it's really about debt. I have Tom Realwright on taxes. And Tom always says the reason people pay taxes is because they're afraid of the IRS. They're afraid of the IRS and you want to pay taxes? You're middle class. You should really listen to Dave Ramsey at that point. Yeah. But if you're going to take on, if you want to be rich, you'd better know the laws of taxes yeah. and you'd be, better be willing to be challenged by the IRS, get an audit and say this is these are the rules. You see, but if you're a coward and you're afraid of the IRS, then you're middle class and poor. This is our whole message. Well, when, I, when I was 22 years old, I went to New York City and I was able to shadow a high-end financial person. I See, when I graduated college, I spent more money my first year out of college than all four years combined on my financial education. After two years, I spent more than any brain surgeon spent going to school to assemble a team and get the knowledge. But when I was 22, I had this epiphany. I walked into a family services firm. So you had to be worth $50 million to operate with this firm. But when I walked in, I got to sit there kind of as a fly on the wall. And around the table was an entire financial team. There was in, there was advisors, there was fiduciaries, there was attorneys, there was accountants. Bankers. And bankers, all at one table making sure to analyze and do the proper due diligence on a deal that was coming through and making sure everything was coordinated so that it wasn't in the individual's name, it was completely something owned by an entity to protect him, that there was downside protection. I mean, I, and I said, I have to build that. Now, I, it was naive when I said that because it was a much bigger uh, situation it took to build that, but I actually created a process. Okay, so just remember this. You don't have a you don't have a uh, financial planner, do you? No. Okay. And on my team, I have attorneys, accountants, and I have a banker. I have a banker who's the head of one of the largest banks right here. I just call him up and I tell him what I want to do. He'll take my phone call. So really, that's our message to you guys here. Please listen to this. What makes the rich richer is that we use debt as money. We have a team and we do our best not to pay taxes. Is that the difference? That's absolutely the difference. So what are your final words you want to say about it so people understand that? See, that's... So if, if you want to just follow the herd, be entrenched in the and sacred cows... follow cows, the sacred yep, cows. I love, then, you know? then just cut back, save money, live within your means, be and hope free. that you're going to be okay um, with the stock market, but be debt-free. If you want to follow the rules of the rich, you have to have an amazing team an intelligent team. And when you do that, you'll pay less in tax because of how you utilize and leverage debt and it'll help you acquire assets and you focus on cash flow, not on 30 years waiting for retirement to come around. So those are some of the differences. Now, if you don't want to do that, then Dave Ramsey or Tony Robbins or Rick Edelman, perfect for you, right? That's, Absolutely. That's the biggest difference of all. The other thing is, are you afraid of a market crash? Not for me. No. You see, the other thing a person... I'll make more money during that. That's time. it. 
You see, the average person who is following the invest for the long term, they're terrified of a market crash. And the real reality is, when the markets come down, the rich get richer. Absolutely. Anything you want to say about that? Because well, actually, during the Great Depression, a third of the people did have that kind of poor mentality, and you see the pictures of them starving and struggling. But a third of the people actually maintained the middle class. They fought hard. It was a struggle, but they were okay. But a third of the people made more money because they looked at it a completely different way, and there was plenty of opportunity if you had the right site. Yeah, and I'm preparing all the time for the crash. Right. I prepare for the market to go up and for the market to come down. And, and you told me this great story of a guy who tried to save his, he was a mutual fund manager. Not who tried the, to the save. The largest mutual fund in the world at and the he, time. And he tried to save his he customers. He tried to right? move money to save the customers and he got fired because it was against the objective of the fund. He wasn't Could allowed you? to do it. I want you to hear that. He couldn't save his customers because he was a mutual fund manager. It was against the law. What did he do that broke the law and he got fired? He moved too much money into bonds because he thought the stock market was going to have a dip. And he was one month early. The stock market, as we remember, in October of 98, had a major dip. He was right, but lost his job at the same time. Because a mutual fund can only do one thing. Do what it's told. Yeah. If you, if you say, we're going to invest in puppies, you can't move them into kitty cats. Yep, even if you know kitty cats is the place right. to be. So the people who are buying that idea of invest for the long term, you know, if you're in mutual funds, you'll probably get wiped out if yeah. you're investing in the up market when it's coming down, right? Yeah, I, re I remember in 2005, I handed Rich Dad Poor Dad to one of my clients. He gave it to his son. His son was intrigued enough to come to one of our events, going, okay, if this is the guy that gave the book, at the end of the eight hours, he says, okay, I'm an airplane engineer, I design airplane engines, and I have $75,000 in 401k, I make $75,000 a year, but you know what, I'm gonna make a change, and in one year, I'm gonna create enough income from my investments to cover my basic expenses. And I was like, that's pretty bold, but he did it in 362 days. He did it by going, he didn't have enough money of his own, so he used debt, he bought a real estate portfolio over time and it created enough cash flow. And then he got to do what he really wanted to do after that. Right. He had the money to do what he wanted right. to do. So I would just say this, we're not just saying go out and borrow money because you have to be smart with what you do. Absolutely. Debt is very dangerous stuff. If you don't want to study how to use debt, then use cash, right? Absolutely. So that's Go back to those middle class and poor Yeah, let's just go back and save money and, you know, uh, live debt free. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with it. You got if your gut can't handle what we do, stay middle class or stay poor. So the final thing is this. I think this is the worst thing I can say. So pay attention. If you're poor or middle class, do we want them on our team? On our team? No. No. Sorry. And that's the worst part. You know, I have so many friends come up to me, they're great people, I like them dearly, I know their kids and all this, and they want to invest with me. And I said, I'm sorry, I can't, because you're poor and middle class. Because you play by different rules. Yeah, but you don't have it inside of you. Yeah. You don't have the education. You know, when you were a kid, I mean, I played softball and I played football and all this stuff. And I was a guy that's, you know, they, you know, they say, okay, we got, let's say, ten guys, and we're going to choose five. And they go, one, two, three, four, you. And then I was always the five. You know, I was one of the one of the guys, the five that wasn't picked. And that's what happens when you're poor and middle class. The rich don't pick you. You know, they say, I'm sorry, you don't, you don't qualify to make the team. So everything Garrett and I are saying is, well, it's good to put a team together. But if you're not a rich person, nobody wants to be on your team. Is that correct? Absolutely not. So you got to invest in yourself. You've got to invest in financial education, and you've got to be serious about it because no one else is just going to get you there on there. It's not some magic thing that happens overnight. It is a commitment. Yeah, I just I just lost a really good I've, I've lost many good friends, but they come to me they tell a good story and I try and help them out, but they did not do what Garrett did. They don't study. You know they think if they hang out with me they'll get rich. You know what I'm talking about? I do know that. And they come around and they're friends and all this, but all of a sudden, you know I'm. You, know, you borrow three hundred million dollars. You better have a financial statement to do that, right? Absolutely. And the guy didn't have a financial. He said, well, can I get in the deal? And said, I'm sorry, you don't have enough money. 
You bring nothing to the table. You know, there's nothing. We don't need you on our team. What do you bring to us? It's not just who you know. It's what you know, too. Yeah, and, what, and are you a player? Yep. You know what I mean? So the worst thing about it is, is by having <laughs> the old sacred cows in your head, nobody wants you on the team except old cows, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm being as harsh as I can because we want you to move on. But the most important thing is to be true to yourself. Look, if you can't control your spending, Susie Orman, listen to her, listen to her, listen to her. If you really don't like risk, then live debt free exactly as Dave Ramsey says, or Tony Robbins says, or Rick Elliman and David Bach. But if you like, my friend is Donald Trump right up there, you know? We play by a different set of rules. Absolutely. But you gotta qualify to make that team, right? Absolutely. And that's probably the most important lesson for you. One's not right or wrong, it's just what's right for you. And the last thing I'll say about my friend Donald, I think is really funny. You know, he's, you have to know what he's saying on him. He gave out his tax plan. And I just laughed at his tax plan when he's running for president. And he says, this is, uh, you know, this plan, this plan. But what he doesn't tell you is those are the tax plans for the poor and middle class. Because the rich don't pay taxes legally. But if you're afraid of paying taxes, then you should be poor and middle class. If you're afraid of the IRS, then you should be poor and middle class. So I hope we've you know, done our best to say it's what's best for you. What's best for you determines who you should listen to, poor, middle class, and rich. Final words from you. Well, thanks for taking the time today. Oh, I always, always love people to think about having their assets be turned into cash flow to get rid of these sacred cows of accumulation, of diversification, of all that stuff. And instead, if they're willing to embrace the rules of the rich, and be able to, you know. Well, it might not be right for them. Yeah, and if they're not, so that's our whole. That you'll know this will turn you off, and you'll yeah. know that doesn't make sense. And for that's me. why I really liked it when I was reading your blog. You had when you read Millionaire Next Door. You said you knew something that didn't fit yep. you, but you read Rich Dad Poor Dad, and it fits you. Yeah. And that's our lesson, to everybody. Thanks very much, and thank you. Thank you. Looking for more on this topic? Check out my video on having what it takes to get rich in one year. Learn what this rocket scientist who hated his nine to five job did to become financially independent in less than one year and then quit his job. I'll see you there. But he did it because it was supposedly a good job and good benefits, but it was benefits that didn't benefit him. Sure, he had health insurance, but he didn't have health. He was 70 pounds heavier than he is today. Sure, he had a retirement plan, but he was never gonna be prepared for retirement. 